Good evening, and thank you for joining the Black Women's Health Imperative for an event being held in observance of National Youth HIV AIDS Awareness Day 2014. We'll be talking to young black women about what influences the way we think about ourselves and our bodies. We want to know these thoughts and feelings and how they impact our behavior, our relationships, and ultimately our sexual health and HIV risk. We thank you all so much for joining us this evening. Um, for all of those out there in YouTube land, please know that this is our first Google Hangout. So uh, we think that we've worked out most of the kinks, but if not, please bear with us. Uh, in the meantime, I'd like to introduce you all to our guest. Uh, first, I have Olamide Ianda. We call her Ola. She's a senior at Morgan State University, and she's interning at the Imperative. Say hey, Ola. Hey. <laughs> okay, and so next we have Monet Ross. She's interning at the Congressional Black Caucus Foundation, and she went to Michigan State. No. And then finally, we have Carly Hill. She is an intern at the National Council for Negro Women, and she is from, let's see. Oh, I lost my paper. Carly, tell us where you're from. <laughs> I'm from Cleveland, Ohio. <laughs> Wonderful. And I'm currently a senior at Howard University. Awesome. Okay. So we're really excited to have these three um, powerful <laughs> young women with us this evening. And we are going to talk about um, how our self image and our self perception are strong indicators of our personal risk for HIV infection. But that's not usually what we talk about when we think about whether we're at risk for HIV. Um, usually we talk about whether you're using a condom, whether your partner and you are faithful, things like that. Um, but we want to get the perspective from our three guests on the connection between our self-image and our sexual health. Okay. So, um, also, I want to make sure that everyone out there knows that you can type in questions to YouTube and we'll be um, able to respond to them at the end of our panel. And then also, if you have any tweets, um, if you're following us on Twitter and you want to tweet at Black Women's Health, that's BLK um, Women's Health, then we can also um, catch your questions there. Okay. So, ladies, I'm going to go ahead and get started. Um, can you tell us, uh, and me specifically, I guess, what influences the way that you think about yourself? Um, what does it mean to you to be young, black, and a woman? And what's special about it or challenging? Don't all jump at once. <laughs> <laughs> um, I'll go first. Okay, great. Thanks, Ola. Um, for the first part of the question, I would say that my religious beliefs influence how I see myself. Um, okay. I basically, I get aff affirmation from my religion. I'm a Christian, so I believe my affirmation comes from God. And the second part of your question, I would say, being a young black woman, um, there's many stereotypes in society about us that we're angry, we're demanding, we're controlling, and other, other stuff. So when I don't fit that norm, it's sometimes hard. I want to be the um, poster child for black women, but sometimes I am. And I don't want to be put in a cat uh, category, but sometimes I, I am perceived that way, even though I don't live that way. So I just say there's stereotypes against us before we open our mouths. And people already judge us based on what they see in the media about us. Okay. Yeah, I think that um, I would agree that stereotypes and judgment can really play a big role in our self-perception, um, as well as our religion. Monet, what do you think? Um, I definitely think that what influences my self-image, I'll have to start off with my family. Um, growing up, your family is the first people who, you know, you learn um, the do's and um, don'ts of life, people who you first love. Um, growing up, I had a strong supportive system in my family, and it definitely um, confirms that I am beautiful. Although I am black, that I do have a lot to offer, and that definitely played a role, a strong role, in my um, confidence. Being black, young, and being a woman, I definitely feel uh, strong. I feel empowered, especially seeing the many black women who are CEOs, who are in high levels. 
executive positions and seeing the things that they have done, things that they have accomplished, that puts me on the right track that I can do whatever I set my mind to. Um, it's definitely just been a positive, it's a positive influence that I try to keep around me as well as make sure I continue to go in the right direction. That's really great. So, you know, just like there are stereotypes associated that might be negative, we also have a lot of role models, I agree with mm -hmm. you, um, that are really achieving quite a bit. And um, it's great that you set your expectations high. So, Carly, what influences the way that you think about yourself? Carly, you still there? Oh, technology. <laughs> Oh, okay. Okay, I definitely think that um, you know, we as people or we as women are only as strong as our weakest link. So I tend to be a lot of people around me. So if I were a young lady, I would have to do something better. And that's pretty much how I should have a big baby or anything. So, I was in a collective, so I never made myself seem very good. Or, you know, just think I feel more confident as me, less than me, like, I'm looking to. But if another thing was going around, I think it's doing really well. I feel really good because I'm happy that everyone else is doing it. Okay, Carly, I think we lost you at the end there. Um, okay, we can hear you now. Okay, you're breaking up just a little bit. Um, for all of those who are out there watching, uh, again, please bear with us. We're just working out some kinks. Okay, so Carly will be back with us shortly, <laughs> um, but I'm really excited to hear um, everyone on our panel say, um, you know, that even as there may be some challenges associated with um, how we feel about ourselves as young black women, there's also definitely some positives. We can have really strong uh, family support systems and um, really strong leaders in our communities mm -hmm. that can um, definitely influence us in positive ways. Okay, so I also want to ask you all, um, because I know that it comes up quite a bit, do you think that um, the media impacts uh, how we think about ourselves at all? I, okay, um, I do. Just in the media, there's, first of all, the media is constantly changing. Um, a lot of, a lot of women are influenced by what they see. Um, for example, the Oscars. Um, Lupita just won an Oscar, and she's, she's receiving so much praise because she's an African-American woman who's attacking to be dark skin. So you hear, a lot of, you hear a lot of feedback saying, you know, it's about time that some women see praise for their appearance or even the natural hair movement that African Americans are going through as far as accepting how they look. So media plays a huge role daily and just in how we speak, it dictates, you know, how we, how we dress sometimes, even how we behave. Yeah, I would agree with that. It's been really exciting to see, um, I think, some positive changes recently yeah. in how we're portrayed. Um, so I'm really hopeful uh, for the girls that are growing up now that they have different role models than say I did, um, you know, 10 or 15 years ago. So mm -hmm. I'm really hopeful for them. Okay, Carly, you're back with us. Um, do you have any thoughts on how the media influences us? Uh oh. 
Okay, well, while we're, um, while we're figuring that out, Ola, I know that uh, you think a lot about our self-image. So what do you think the um, media's impact is on us, uh, particularly as black women? Um, I thought um, the media, and they were saying earlier, they do broadcast um, accomplishments and our success in the media with Michelle Obama's Let's Move movement, actress winning the award, even with um, Gabrielle Douglas winning the um, Olympics, they broadcast that, but most of the times they also um, choose to portray us in one image, which all of us don't fit, but um, as time is going, they're, um, black women are being recognized in the media more and more for accomplishments, so I see progression in how we're portrayed, um, we're being valued in society now than we did in the past years. So, yeah. Yeah, I think progression is a really good way of thinking about it. Um, it's hopefully going forward. I'm curious to know, it's been a few years now um, since I've been on a college campus, but what impact do you see um, college having on the self-esteem of young women? Like, are you different when you go in as a freshman than when you come out as a senior? And what's that like? Um, I can answer that. So definitely at Howard, you know, it's a uh, it's a historically black college. Mm -hmm. So here, especially, we're challenged to really separate ourselves because you have to think um, that everyone is pretty much like you. Most of it's mostly the top students, and they're mostly uh, of color. So it's no longer a separating factor when it comes to what you are capable of. So especially on a campus like this, um, it's very important to uphold a certain type of image and to um, separate yourself because you're among so many people who are just like you. And from my personal experience, I definitely um, can see a lot of uh, growth in me because I never would have had to think about certain things about myself mm. if they hadn't been for being surrounded by so many people that were like me. So that plays a big role. That's really interesting, Carly. Um, I went to a predominantly white college, and so um, it tended to be that there were only a few hundred of us, and we all just kind of stuck together, <laughs> for lack of a better word. And sometimes that was good, and then sometimes it brought its own challenges with it. But um, I am really curious to know, Ola, I know you're at Morgan State, if you've had that same experience with needing to separate yourself um, and kind of discovering new things about yourself in that way? Yes. Um, yeah, like you said, I, I go to Morgan State. Um, my first two years at Morgan State, I wasn't really thinking about the future. Mm. So I basically went with the flow and followed everybody else. But when I joined the public health program, um, I met my advisor, Dr. Yeboa. And she was a Morgan State alumni, and she basically changed my perception of myself, that I could accomplish more with my college degree and achieve more in life. I could also be a doctor like her. So seeing her and what she came through, what she went from and what she went through, just inspired me to do more. Um, she's from New York, and she had a single parent household, and she got scholarships to Morgan State, and she basically used that to propel her future. And that's inspired me to do the same, just having that kind of role model. And I just like, um, ever since being in public health, I'm inspired to be like her and to know that black women can achieve more. That's by seeing her and what she went through. So being at Morgan State definitely realized that, made me realize that I could achieve more in life. And they basically invested more in me as a human being, um, giving me connections, giving me points and tips helping me out when I used to go to VCU for my freshman year, which is um, a TWI, and um, I was an outcast there. They didn't really invest in me. But coming to Morgan State, they really invested in me as a human being and really set my path for my future. Um, well, I also went to a predominantly white institution at Michigan State. Um, well, growing up, I was high school in Detroit, Michigan. My high school was pretty much 100% um, African American. So I was always surrounded by people who are going through the same things, people who have the same questions, and, you know, just looking for, like, people on the same track, 
So when I went to Michigan State University, a lot of people from my high school actually ended up attending there as well. But fortunately, um, I was able to find a network of black students, um, such as like a black student union or a mentorship program that pretty much just brought in the minority students and made them feel at home, made them feel welcome. Um, even for the freshman students, when I became a senior, we mentored young African-American students and pretty much introduced them to the campus and make them feel like they're welcome, like they're not by yourself. Because Michigan State is a large, it's a huge school, but just having that sense of community definitely helped with me and my development. Um, I became more comfortable with who I am, more likely to express myself in situations where I find that it might be a little bit difficult. It made me feel like I have to have a voice for myself because although I may be the only black student in the classroom, I still have to prove a point to myself as well as to my peers that I am not that stereotype that you are used to hearing about or used to seeing that, you know, I'm someone that needs to be recognized. Yes, it's interesting um, that what I'm hearing kind of across everyone's experiences, whether you're um, in a group that's entirely folks of color or if you're potentially the only one in the classroom, um, a lot of what makes a difference, uh, particularly in college, is I think mentorship and community. Um, so it's good that you all had that experience. I do want to, um, of course, we are doing this chat in observance of National Youth HIV AIDS Awareness Day, um, which was on April 10th. And um, as you may know, most of the time when African American women contract HIV in the US, it is through um, heterosexual relationships. And so I do want to get into our relationships. I know for me, during college, um, and even still now, because DC is a lot like college in some ways, <laughs> um, <laughs> then um, you, relationships on campus were sort of a touchy subject, um, particularly among the African American students. And so I'm wondering, you all seem to have such amazing like self-confidence and you're very self-possessed. Um, how does your self-confidence and your self-image connect to the choices that you made in relationships? Um, I'll answer that one. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you for being brave. You're welcome. Okay, so I think the number one rule when you're picking a mate or when you're picking a mate is you want someone who reflects the traits that you value in yourself. Whether that be if you, that, if you see yourself as um, confident, you want someone who is also confident. And when moving forward and picking a mate, I have to think about what is it that I feel like I'm worth. Um, growing up, we're taught, so young women are taught not to settle for less. So that gap in between when we're actually taught that lesson and when it's actually implemented, that's important. I mean, we are we're influenced by media and peer pressure and things like that, and that, that plays a huge part. But that can mess up your mess with your self esteem and how you value yourself and ultimately how you pick how you pick your mate. Okay, I really like that. Um, actually, I'm going to write that down for my own personal use. That your mate should really reflect your worth. Um, I think that's a lesson that we can all learn across the ages. Um, does anybody else have any experiences with how your self concept relates to who you choose to be your partner? Um, for me, um, I when I pick a partner, I pick a partner that basically will respect my values and will not try to alter them for their personal gain. So I need someone on the same page as me in terms of what I want in relationships. And if they're not willing to cooperate with that, then they are no longer um, they can't be my partner. Basically, mm -hmm. I need somebody who's able to willing to respect my beliefs and my moral and my core, um, core values. And if they can't respect it, then we're, we can't happen. And like, I just want the same page as me. Yeah, I think being on the same page is really important. I would agree with that. Um, and it's great that you've already identified your core values. Um, yeah, that's really important. Um, 
Carly, how are things over there at Howard? I've heard that dating there is very interesting. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm sure everyone's heard of the ratio. Mm -hmm. um, it's definitely a significantly a higher number of women than it is males here. So um, you can take that as many ways as you want to. <laughs> the guys take it as a challenge, most of them. And the young ladies, Sometimes they fall for it, sometimes they don't. But, like, mm -hmm. personally, I work in a dorm. Um, I'm a resident assistant. I work in a dorm with all females, freshmen, and I see it. Um, a lot of the young ladies, you can see the confidence level. Um, it goes across the board. So some of the young ladies fall for the traps of the crazy young men that wait in the lobby for people to come check them in. Mm -hmm. And some of them are too strong for that. And Eventually, I've seen that as they get older, you know, the guys start to settle down and they kind of tie themselves down. But I haven't seen too many people just actually lock it down. And it's kind of sad watching the young ladies that you, that clearly don't have a lot of confidence, you know, being kind of drawn into these young men because they'll tell them anything. Like, if people will park outside of our building and just try to figure out, you know, who can check them in and get whoever they can. And it's sad, but, and I try to do my best to talk them out of it, but, you know, it's very interesting here at Howard. You know, it's always so interesting when people talk about um, Howard's dorms, because at my college, we didn't have anyone checking us in or out. So um, I think even from freshman year, it was easier to, we used to call it creeping, um, it was much easier to go in and out of people's dorms and kind of conduct your relationships, um, if that's what you were calling it, you could conduct it a little bit more privately, uh -huh. uh, but one thing that sounds really familiar to me is just this concept of the ratio, and I think even being a few years out of college now, um, you still see all of these articles going out, like they'll talk about it in papers as big as the New York Times about the ratio of black women to black men. Um, and I'm curious to know what you all think about, I guess, our options as black women um, and if, if you all feel like you have options when it comes to choosing your partner because I would suggest um, that you know, what you feel like you're presented with will impact who you choose to be with. I definitely think that, um, well, that question sounds like, well, women are in control, ultimately. Mm. Though there may not be um, a healthy amount of men at, you know, at Howard or at Michigan State or at Morgan State, I think that if you portray yourself in a way that reflects your confidence, reflects how you value yourself, reflects your self-worth, you'll attract the right mate. Um, whereas, you know, you seem like you may, you may be missing some things, you have low self-esteem, and that's people that you'll attract. Mm -hmm. um, it's all about understanding your wealth, your worth, rather. And I think that, like I was saying earlier, that relates back to your family, um, your friends, your immediate circle, the people you surround yourself with, the people who you know, you feel like you can share anything with. Those are the people that have the strongest effect on the strongest effect on how you view yourself. And at the end of the day, I think that when moving forward, if people just understand or you know, get the concept of you attract uh, that you attract what you portray. Mm. Uh, can I comment on that too? Please do. You know, that's, I'm just, I'm just speaking from a perspective of seeing this every day. That's so much easier said than done for some of these young ladies. Um, it's easy to tell them, you know, just wait and you'll attract blah, blah, blah. But when they're constantly approached with the same thing or they're constantly hurt, it's hard to counsel them into um, believing that. And I just see it so often, and I'm trying, and I'm really working on a way to get them to get it. It's hard to get them to get it, um, but we know. But of course, you know, if they haven't experienced that, 
they haven't experienced anyone who didn't hurt them or who didn't just, you know, hit it and quit it or what have you. They just don't believe it. And it's hard for them. And that's where I think we get to the issue of contracting all of these sexually transmitted diseases, especially in the young ladies who lack the confidence. The ones who will, like, say it's a young lady who has terrible self-esteem. People tell her all the time she's beautiful, but she knows that, you know, she just doesn't feel that way. And a young man approaches her and says, you know, yeah, you know, I want to whatever. And she's not going to turn him down, although that's not what she necessarily wants. She's not going to turn him down. Why? Because she's not used to that type of attention or she hasn't experienced anyone saying those types of things to her. So... Mm -hmm. It's just a, a terrible place to be in for us as women, for, for some of us. Yeah, I think, um, oh, Ola, are you about to comment on that? No, I was just agreeing with her because it is easier said than done. Um, going to Morgan State, you know, you see it a lot. Um, you see all these beautiful girls with low self-esteem, and they put their, well, they're predicaments where they receive affirmation and love from these guys who aren't really willing to settle with them, who are just using them for sexual pleasures and saying what they feel the girls want to hear. So the girls are thinking that these guys really love them, but a month from, from now, they're no longer friends, they don't talk, he's rude to her, he ignores her, and these girls' self-esteem just gets worse from what it was before. So, um... Yeah, I agree with Carly, but Monet has a point. If you want to attract the right guy, if you want, I mean, like, if you have, if you have a high self-esteem, you'll attract a guy who has a high self-esteem, too. But it's hard to tell these girls that when they're not used to seeing it or they're not, they never experienced that before. Um, yeah, because I had experiences like that my freshman and sophomore in college, but, um, yeah, I just changed my whole perception about myself. And so I was carrying myself in a different way. And because I was doing that, I started attracting the guys that I used to. And they, they, I guess they, they knew they weren't up to my new standards. And I wasn't going to rock with them anymore or even pay attention to them anymore. So um, I started carrying myself in a different way. I started attracting different people. Um, I practiced abstinence. So because I practiced abstinence, I started attracting friends who also practice the same beliefs that I do. And now I have friends who all practice, practice the same thing I practice. So like Monet was saying, if you want something, if you want um, to attract the right thing, you have to act that way too. But sometimes it's hard to tell a girl who never seen it before or ever experienced it before that she can do it too, like Carly was saying. Yeah. Well, one more thing, especially with this generation, um, the, okay, we're all seniors or graduates, but I'm looking at the freshmen in my building in particular, and I literally watched the young other freshman boys sit in here and tell me, like, oh, yeah, I'll, I'll say, why are you messing with all of these different girls, you know? Then you just leave with that other girl. I'll say that to them, and they'll say, they know we don't go together, and they're allowing these people to say these things to them, and it's up to us as older people to tell them, you know, that's not appropriate. You need to do better. You know, that's not what life is. This is not all that it is. But these young ladies, it's like sometimes they don't understand and they're really stubborn and they come with a different mindset of they just have it all figured out. And we have to teach them that they are teachable and that we all are teachable. We know something and they know something. We can um, and a lot of people think once one experience, one bad thing happens, it's all over. But that's not the case based on that. And even for for some young men also, you know, they think one girl broke their heart and they take it worse low key than the women do. Mm. When a young woman messes up a young man, it's detrimental completely like and they just don't recover from it. So they started abusing the woman women and doing what they need to do. So it's just I don't know. Yeah, it's it's a lot to think about. I mean, you all brought a, up a lot of things that um, I hope our audience caught. Um, there's the idea that, of course, your self-esteem definitely affects how you approach um, finding a partner if that's what you want 
or choosing not to be sexually active if that's what you want to do. Um, I think it also was important that you all mentioned, um, particularly in your experience as an RA, Carly, where you see these multiple relationships and these multiple sexual partners happening. Um, and when it comes to our HIV risk, it's really important that we're aware of whether our partners are monogamous with us. Like, are we all on the same page about this? And if we're choosing to be a little bit more casual with our sex, um, that is an option for some of us. If, um, if it corresponds, you know, with your religious beliefs and your values, um, it's definitely an option, but it's really important, and I think it's also really hard when you're a young woman just entering college that you know that that's what you're getting into. And then you make choices around that to keep yourself safe, um, whether it's using a condom or getting tested or even just having conversations with your partner. Like if, as you said, the young men say, um, you know, they know that we don't go together. Okay, well, what does that mean? Does that mean that, um, that we're each, you know, not being faithful to one another because like monogamy is not a thing that we're into right now and so then are we using a condom every time or does that mean that I'm over here falling in love and uh, you're not for I mean just to keep it simple so I think that it's it's really wonderful that it sounds like you all are all trying to mentor the young women coming up behind you um, because our relationships really do impact the rest of our lives. Um, and I know that when I was young and in college, I, I remember getting an HIV test, but it was just because it was like an observance day. And they were out there on the quad, and it was just a thing to do. But I wasn't thinking about my sexual health. I wasn't thinking about things like HPV or the whole other list of um, sexually transmitted infections that I could name today and, you know, kind of bring us all down. <laughs> um, but that wasn't on my mind. And when I thought about becoming sexually active or choosing not to or choosing a partner, um, I know that I certainly wasn't thinking about the sort of conversations that I would want to have with a partner now knowing the information that I have. Um, do you think, and I'd be particularly interested to know what the RA on our panel has seen, do you think that girls and guys are talking to their partners about sex um, and sexual health? I'll say that. I think that probably they're talking about sex. <laughs> uh, not as much as they should, definitely. Um, they, it's actually kind of a taboo thing to talk about, at least when they're together. Um, I know... Personally, I'm a health education major, so I bring a lot of programs to the building that are focused on sexual health and everything. So it's interesting to see that the young ladies, when it's just the young ladies there, they'll talk all day about what they won't do and what they will, you know, and mm -hmm. all this craziness. But then when the young men are there with them, they kind of shut down and they won't be as vocal or it's a one or two of them that will say something and it's weird and that's and that kind of shows me that I know that they're not very comfortable speaking to them about certain things um, and I see it they won't even take condoms we're passing out condoms they'll be too embarrassed and all of this and so I don't think that the dialogue is as fluid as it should be between the young men and the young women yeah, I think that um, that dialogue can be really challenging. Um, and I'm also curious to know, you know, what can, what can college campuses do or what can um, you all as seniors or those of us who have graduated, what can we do? Um, because I know, and Ola, I'll let you tell this story, but Ola has told us a story here in the office about a couple of young women um, that became HIV positive um, from having sex with the same partner on Morgan State's campus. And so I think it's, it's really important that we figure out how to get these conversations going and how to get um, 
girls to protect themselves to the extent that they can and get guys to protect themselves. What can we do, do you all think? I'll go first. Uh, um, like you said earlier, um, Morgan State had a, a HIV outbreak uh, my sophomore year or my junior year at Morgan State. My sophomore year. Um, spring semester, two girls, two guys, um, contracted HIV. And um, they both had the same sexual um, partner with the guy. Like, that was a sexual partner, but they were in a relationship with him. So Morgan State took action and basically had free HIV testing. They were um, told to come get tested, free of charge. Um, and then FDA got involved by passing out condoms. And basically motivating people to get um, HIV testing. It was Monday, Tuesday, it was Monday, Wednesday, Friday of the week, and they had it during periods of times where people were free to take it. And then they would call you with your test results, so you have to go to them. Um, but I believe we we should definitely really should promote um, free HIV testing. Um, that is free. People think it's a charge, but it really is free. And just point them to the direction where they can take the test, um, or maybe even bring it to college campuses. I know there was a mobile truck going around Morgan State um, last year's spring, giving out free HIV testing. It was parked not that far from the student center, so people can usually walk over and get tested. But really, tell them, really based activating, activating, advocating for HIV testing, and just letting them know that it doesn't hurt. It's just a swab. It's just a, it's a quick test. Nothing free of charge. And letting them know that it can really help their health, and just to be aware of their status, just to be, it's a really thing to talk to your partner about their status, just to know your status is very important, and to know if you're healthy, and to prevent prevent um, prevent spreading of HIV. It just uh, it's just a caution that we take. It doesn't hurt, but people just don't have the knowledge of it. I bet I guess, and just to really, if you bring awareness to it, people will see that it's not that big. It was a big. No, but that doesn't take, it's not going to hurt you or anything. Just to be cautious and to prevent others from getting HIV. I agree with Ola. It was definitely important to educate yourself, make sure you know about different contraceptives, make sure you know about the different STIs that you can contract. Um, when I lived in the dorms, my RA, um, Carly, I'm not sure you may be able to relate to this, but my RA kept a um, like a tub of condoms for the residents to have or, you know, to grab. And, of course, you know, you may see, like, the guys grabbing multiple um, just to, like, to show it off. And then the girls are always hesitant. Um, a few girls on my floor where you can ask, you know, a friend, hey, can you get this? So it is, you know, it is this taboo that women need to, like, they should be, so it's like you want women to be prepared and you want them to know what they how to take the right steps, you know, to protect themselves, but then question them when they actually try to get condoms or, you know, they ask questions, you know, like, well, where are the different types of birth control? So I think for us to actually accept the idea that women out here want to be safe also, you know, just, you know, recognize that it's okay to get a condom and not make it such, you know, pointing the finger or make them seem like, you know, you're out here, you know, with multiple men. And that also relates back to your self-esteem. You start to, like, you can start to feel bad if, just because you want to take extra measures to protect yourself, so you start to feel bad and you start to think, like, okay, well, maybe I shouldn't do this. And then that puts you in danger. That puts you at a higher risk of contracting, you know, STI or HIV or AIDS because you don't want people to look at you funny. Or, you know, you just rather just stay on the side and wait for the guy to actually go to the store and get kind of, and you're putting, you're putting your own sexual health into someone's hand, someone else's hands. Yeah, I think that's an excellent point. It's so important um, that we as young women make sure that we take charge of our own sexual health um, whether it's going to get tested, as you mentioned, Ola, when we see um, testing come around. Um, because, yes, at most testing events now, they do the swabs, so you don't have to wait very long to get your test back. Um, it doesn't require any pain. Um, and if you all, um, especially out there watching, don't know, um, they also have 
now in many CVSs, I know at least here in DC, they have um, your home test. Um, I have my own personal concerns about that because if you are positive, you may not want to find out um, on your own. But at the same time, if you have real concerns about privacy and you need to know something instantly, um, it's better for you to know and then use the information that's provided to you in the packet, of, um, packet that comes with the test than for you to not know. Um, I see a hand. <laughs> Going back to what Monet said about the taboos of females getting condoms. Yes. I know when I first came to Morgan, there was an organization called Divas. And basically, they were go basically young girls going around distributing condoms. Um, they were basically trying to shut down the taboo and the stereotypes that females can't get condoms and the, the looks that females get when they do get condoms. So what they would do would... They will come to the dorms or the off-campus housing and knock on your door. And if you're a female or a guy, they'll give you a condom. So it'd be between you and them, not the whole world knowing that you're getting a condom for them from them. And it was just to show that, you know, girls do care about getting condoms and nothing to be ashamed about in getting a condom. So they just um, kind of basically turn on the t um, stereotype and the taboo of getting condoms. Yeah. I think that's I think that's really great. Um, I hope that lots of colleges have something similar to that um, because some of us are more private and we want to find ways to reduce the stigma of using condoms and of um, and of getting tested as much as possible. Um, I also want to let you all know that you can always go to the Black Women's Health Imperatives website. Um, it's Black Women's Health. Dot org, that's dot .org, and we have a campaign called Elevate. Uh, we talk a lot about elevating the conversation around HIV and sexual health. Um, so a lot of what we want to do is reduce the stigma among black women when it comes to talking about HIV. Um, it's important to know that when you're thinking about your sexual health and asking questions and getting information, it doesn't mean that you're dirty, it doesn't mean that you're a slut or that you're out here fast or in the streets or whatever terminology the kids are using these days. <laughs> um, it just means that you're being proactive and you're doing all the things that these amazing young women are talking about um, and taking charge of your sexual health and protecting yourself and your partners and your communities. Um, we also want to always make sure that we plug the Affordable Care Act um, because now, if you all didn't know, then you can stay on your parents' insurance until you're age 26, um, and HIV testing, and also other STI testing, um, and preventative sexual health uh, services like your pap test and your well woman exam are all included uh, without copay if you're on insurance. So if you're 26 and under and you have not um, gotten onto your parents' insurance. You can do that. You don't have to worry about the deadline that just passed on March 31st. You can get on your parents' insurance or stay on um, at any time, which I know is particularly helpful for our graduating seniors while you all are looking for a job. Um, let's see. So we have a question uh, that came in from YouTube. Connie Johnson wants to know if this conversation is being recorded, and yes, it is. Uh, we thank you, Connie, for tuning in, and this will be available on the Black Women's Health Imperatives YouTube channel. We'll probably do a little bit of editing, um, but it will be up on our YouTube channel. And then we have a question from Lisa fager Bediaco, who is one of our Act Against AIDS Leadership Initiative partners. Thanks for tuning in, Lisa. And she has a question for the panel. She wants to know, who are you all's role models? Um, and I think that that's a great question because... You all seem to really be ahead of the game um, as far as being informed and having great self-image and protecting yourselves. So talk to us about your role models a little bit. Oh, All right, I'll say. Um, so my role model is my mother. Um, obviously, first person in my life, um, along with my father. But my mother is a strong woman. Um, she's always kept an open relationship with me. So as 
time when um, a lot of my peers were experiencing confusion or did not know what was going on um, with their bodies or did not understood, understand what was going on, like the peer pressures. My mom definitely kept an open relationship with me. Um, she helped me through a lot of younger, um, a lot of problems I experienced when I was younger as well as my father. But I definitely look up to her for being a woman who, that, that, I'm sorry, for being a woman who understands that in order to succeed in this world, that you need to understand what it is that you offer and then always, always make sure that it's portrayed and that everyone can see. That's great. It's really good to hear about um, strong mother-daughter relationships. Uh, we know that despite what you may think, parents, uh, most girls and guys um, as they're growing up really want to hear about their sexual health um, and what they can do um, as their bodies are changing and as they're getting into their first relationships. They want to hear that from their parents. So it's great that you all were able to talk about that and it sounds like that really um, helped keep you grounded. Okay, I can say my role model. Well, I really can't narrow down a role model. Like I told you all earlier, I'm very community oriented, and I don't necessarily think that each person's path is the same. So I don't have any one person that I would um, call my role model, but I do think that all women around me are my role models. Um, I feel like I learned something from everyone. Um, if I see something that I like or that I, that can help me, I use that and that helps to build me. I'm always learning from someone in every experience. So I wouldn't limit myself to just one role model. Um, I couldn't do that. Like I literally was trying to think about who would I say was my role model and I think literally every, every woman that I've met, if, if she's doing something bad or she's doing something good, I'm, lear I'm learning something, so I'm, I want to model that if I like it, you know, so that's how I feel. I think that's really beautiful. Um, one of the things that I think gets lost sometimes for us here in the U.S. is that, you know, everything is so, like, individualistic, um, and it's kind of every person for themselves sometimes. So it's really great to hear that uh, you're so open and you're always learning and that you believe so strongly in community. Um, here at The Imperative, we believe in community, and we were founded on the idea of uh, women coming together and improving their own health. And so, yeah, it's always wonderful to hear that perspective. Thank you. Okay, I guess I'll go. <laughs> <laughs> I have two role models. Um, the first one is definitely my mom. Um, being the first woman that I know I met, I met on earth, <laughs> being my mom. But um, my mom was very open about sex when I was growing up. At a young age, she was always talking about sex to me and my brothers. Like she was too open, like <laughs> very raw, uncensored, <laughs> no lies, like tell it all. And um, basically, my mom always pushed me, always encouraged me. She's always looking out for me, you know. Even when I thought I couldn't do anything, she would always be like, "Yes, you can." Just give me affirmation that. I I need it. And she's always there when no one's in my corner, always supporting me, always defending me. And, you know, my second role model would definitely have to be um, my advisor slash professor, Dr. Yeboa. Um, she's the one that actually got me this internship. <laughs> you know, I wasn't sure what to do my internship, and she just made some calls, pulled some connections, and she got me here. Um, people call me her twin because we actually do look alike. Um, we're the same, almost the same height, same size, everything. She's a baby face too. And um, basically like the fact that she went to Morgan and now that she's a doctor and she's well respected in her field just made me value who she is as a person and made me realize that I could do the same thing too. Despite her background and upbringing, she defined all odds that people thought she couldn't defy. And now she's a professor and advisor at Morgan State part-time and she's just always helping us out especially even though we give her a hard time sometimes she's always looking out for us always keeping tabs on us always encouraging us because she lets us know that we're black in a 
public health field, which is not really a black field, it's really a white field. And just know that we can make a difference and we are there for a reason. Just let us know that we're able to do what we can, we can do. So she's basically my second role model because I want to achieve what she has achieved and she's basically shown me that I can achieve it. That's really great. It's so important to have uh, professional role models and mentors and people that you can look up to. Um, and my question was going to be, you know, what can we do and what are you all doing um, to improve both the self-image of your peers and yourself? Um, and it really sounds like what I'm hearing from everybody is the importance of role models and mentorship and talking to um, those that are coming up behind you. Um, so I guess to start to kind of wrap things up, I'm curious to know what resources do you all think that young women on college campuses need, whether it's um, one of our HBCUs or a pre um, predominantly white institution. What resources do young women need when it comes to improving their sexual health and lowering their HIV risk? Uh, I think that, okay, we all have to take a health class, but I think that some things should be more so inculcated into the curriculum. Okay. Um, I know here at Howard, it's always something going on that has to do with sex. Like, we get a lot of grants, especially in my department, um, to put on certain programs in the dorms, um, on campus and what have you, do fairs and we do HIV testing every month in every single dorm free of charge. Um, they give incentives. So all of that I think is covered. I think that it needs to be more mandatory, like more mandatory things happening on the campuses um, in order to get the people involved because the incentives are okay. We get the same people that come to get tested every month but it needs to be something that has to happen. It shouldn't be optional to a certain extent, at least one or two times during your experience. Interesting. So the idea um, that you have, Carly, is that we've given, you know, lots of incentives. People have lots of reasons to go get tested and get information. I mean, at some point, um, you think it should be required. Okay. Right. Ola, did you have a thought? Is this question limited to only college campuses? Well, no, if you have an idea outside of that, let's talk about it. Okay, I was thinking like maybe a, a national program directed towards um, young college students, young adults, with a spokesman behind it. Because um, all these programs that we throw every month, all of these incentives that we do, people are not really responding like they should. It's becoming very common and the norm do something new, something fresh. So it looks like a national program just focused on young adults and their sexual health. Maybe with a popular spokesman that everybody can relate to or everybody values in society, promoting this awareness, maybe it will bring some change to how young adults respond to their sexual health. Okay. Um, I like that idea of the national program. Um, I do want to remind everybody about... Um, the Imperatives Elevate program. It, I believe the URL is elevattheconversation.org. And if not, you can always go to our main website, blackwomenshealth.org, um, and find out about our national program. But Ola, I would love to talk to you if you have some ideas about national spokespeople. Um, <laughs> <laughs> and we can talk offline about that. <laughs> yeah, I agree with Ola. Um, definitely talking about. He spoke about having a spokesperson. I think the main thing is to provide a sense of community so people can openly talk about it. I know for me, um, I've always been surrounded by women who were going through the same things as I am currently. I live with two other um, young women, and we talk about everything. And just having someone here to speak with, um, to tell about like you know my day or talk about whatever issue, it makes me feel like I'm not alone. So just making sure that people don't feel like they're by themselves and making them feel comfortable so that they can openly ask questions or can openly, you know, seek advice, things to do, things to not do. So I think that's how we can move forward. And definitely also like women empowerment programs. I know in Michigan State we had 
um, a lot of those programs, a lot of organizations, um, I specifically speak about one organization was called Successful, Successful Black Women, and in that organization we touched on um, sexual health with African American women, professionalism, um, things like that. So it's not like, you know, in a big campus, you have people you can relate with. You have people who have the same types of, you know, same discussion as you. And I think that's how we can move forward as far as making sure everyone understands what's going on in sexual health. Yeah, I think that um, most of us learn best when we feel comfortable, and that sense of community is something that's really challenging. I think that um, when you're working on health programs and HIV, there's always kind of this tension because on the one hand, you want lots of attention. So it's important to kind of go big and do these big national programs like Elevate the Conversation, uh, but then at the same time, what really gets people to open up and start thinking about their risk factors is oftentimes the small conversations mm -hmm. that are three people and five people and ten people. Um, so it's really interesting that both are very important. Yeah. Can, I ask, can I ask something? Please. Um, I know that it, there are so many programs and resources out here that are already available, and I feel like a lot of times we separate them, um, and everyone is doing their own thing. For instance, it's a program over at Children's Hospital that's right behind our campus, and they have a department where they do outreach to the community. And we do, and it's a program called Voices that we put on all the time in the dorm. And they offer like one-on-one -on -one sessions. Or say I have a few residents who are too nervous to come to the program because they didn't want to talk about condoms or safe sex. She'll meet, come and meet with them, you know, in small groups or whatever. But a lot of people don't know that. A lot of people just see the big signs about everything, but they are exposed to it. So I think we just need to inform each other about the smaller resources that are available so that it can become more regular for everyone. And they have no excuse not to use it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think, that's, I think that's a really good point um, because there are lots of resources out there. The Imperative has resources, NCNW has resources, the Congressional Black Caucus Foundation has resources, um, and then of course there are community-based organizations that have been working on HIV um, since the epidemic began here in the U.S. Um, in the 80s, but it's so important that we continue to always let people know where the resources are, where they can go. Um, I, of course, am going to plug the imperative again. Uh, one of the things that we do have on our website is a connection to testing centers. So if you go to our HIV page, there's a place um, and it connects right back to a CDC widget. Um, and you put in your zip code and you can find out where to get tested. And most testing centers also have information. Um, they'll do counseling with you. They'll do HIV, um, HIV counseling with you about your risk and about any behaviors or any concerns that you may have. Um, and that's really important. Uh, we do want to wrap things up because it's coming on 8 o'clock. And I know you all have homework or... Maybe I have homework. <laughs> we want to wrap things up. So if you all have any final thoughts, um, can you share those with us? Um, I, definitely, well, I think that I like the connection between self-image and self-perception and whether or not that affects our risk for HIV. Um, the more, I think someone touched on it earlier about, I think it was Carly actually, she said that women who are not used to getting attention from men, they often are more sexually active. Um, just, you know, in turn, filling that void. They're looking for someone to, you know, accept them as they are. And I know that it is easier said than done um, that... Oh yeah, just have high self, you know, high self, have high, 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 high self confidence, carry yourself to a certain standards. But I think that 
if we create these communities and like what Ola said, have a spokesperson to make people understand and educate themselves and start small and just talk to people, you know, like how, what do you think about this situation? Make sure people are comfortable. I think that would be a lot positive. And then also just work on eliminating the stigma that women shouldn't protect themselves and take control of their own sexual health and control like their lives and their futures. I love it. I love it. And I can say my biggest thing that I would add would be just pretty much lifting as we climb and realizing that we are each other. So regardless of my self-esteem or you all self-esteem, the one young lady who has both self-esteem is representing all of us. Mm -hmm. So we have to identify with her. It's, we have to all realize that that is us. And we are only as strong as our weakest link. Mm. So, with that being said, you know, everything that we do needs to be helping someone else. It needs to be lifting someone else. And that, I think, will force us to be better. So, for instance, if we see a young lady in the act, not in the act, but <laughs> you, see, <laughs> you see something happening, like, hey, you see a profile you know, it's our it's our um, job to actually step in and you know maybe help her out in those predicaments. That makes a big difference. Um, or pulling her to the side afterwards and talking to her and trying to figure out what's going on, because those small things make a big difference. And slowly they'll remember those things happening, and then later they can talk about their story. So that's what I would like to leave everyone with who's listening. Just Remember that you are not you. You're not an island. You're representing whoever is like you. So that's important to realize. Great. Okay. Well, um, we're going to wrap up. And um, as we close out, I do want to thank you all once again. Um, and I want to make sure that we thank our Act Against AIDS Leadership Initiative partners, the National Council for Negro Women, and the Congressional Black Caucus Foundation for participating with us and for sending us these amazing um, and powerful young women to participate. Um, I want to thank everyone that's out there in our audience participating in our first Room Full of Sisters uh, Google Hangout. If you all have um, any questions or you want to continue to talk to us, um, then I have two ways that you can get in touch with us. You can find us on Twitter, at Black Women's Health. That's B-L-K, Women's Health. And then, of course, you can always go to our website. It's blackwomenshealth.org. And please remember, women's is plural with an E. <laughs> My name is Samantha Griffin, and I want to thank you all. Um, but let's see. I think that's all the notes that I have. So remember, as our very eloquent young women have said, um, we want to continue to elevate the conversation around HIV and sexual health. We want to eliminate stigma around HIV. Um, we want to remain in community and be compassionate with one another. If you see another young woman that needs a little bit of assistance, be gentle and be kind. Um, and be sure to lift as we climb. I love that phrase, Carly. Um, and then make sure that if you're kind of self-possessed and you've got good self-esteem, then be a role model for one another and continue to take control of your sexual health and elevate the conversation. So we're going to sign off for this evening, and we look forward to seeing you um, during another conversation, whether it's in person or on Google or on Twitter. And we will continue to have lots of rooms full of sisters. Thank you all, and have a good night. Thank you. Good night. Thank you.